Shiro Emiya is, without hyperbole, one of the most misunderstood characters I've encountered in quite some time. Based on my own experience, whenever I ask fans of the visual novel what they think of Shiro, I tend to get a wide variety of interesting interpretations. Alternatively, however, fans of the anime adaptations predominantly deride his character for being stubborn, reckless, and stupid. Not exclusively, mind you, but this seems to be the consensus. And with that in mind, I want to explore why there's such a stark difference in how his character is perceived by fans of the source material and its adaptations, as well as do a bit of digging into Shiro's character in order to help the audience understand him better. We will primarily be looking at the Fate Stay Night Unlimited Blade Works adaptation animated by Studio Ufotable, as is the most well-known and relevant regarding this issue. Also, please note that there is no official translation for the Fate Stay Night visual novel, and that I must use an unofficial, fan-translated version version provided by Mirror Moon back in 2009. To get the ball rolling, we're going to be looking at the Archer vs. Caster fight set in Honoji Temple. Just prior to the battle, Shiro had been captured by Caster. Then Archer makes an appearance and attempts to save Shiro against his better judgment. During this scene, Shiro remarks to Archer that he doesn't need his help and to let him go as he carries him, to which Archer obliges and kicks him away from yet another attack, ironically saving Shiro once again. This scene in particular is like a microcosm of what anime fans dislike about Shiro, because it emphasizes the three main sticking points mentioned earlier. Shiro yelling at and refusing to accept Archer's help comes across as both stubborn and reckless, because despite the fact that he's up against someone floating in the air, raining down giant magical death lasers, he'd prefer to do things himself rather than logically accepting help. With these two perceived qualities clashing together, it inevitably makes Shiro appear as very stupid, especially when you consider that Shiro is, for all intents and purposes, a normal human being, one who is up against a servant, a magical being of great power that far surpasses anything Shiro is currently capable of. In this instance, Archer, who is similarly a servant like Castor, is literally Shiro's only real hope of survival. When looking at the anime's interpretation of the scene, it becomes very easy to see why Shiro is looked down upon as this bumbling buffoon. However, things are noticeably different when we take a look at the source material. Initially, the spoken dialogue is much the same. Shiro replies to Archer's help by saying, Just let go of me. I can take care of this myself. I don't need your help. However, unlike the anime, we also get a glimpse into Shiro's thought process, which contextualizes this piece of dialogue. I've been saved, but I just can't accept this. No. More than that, I can't stand to be a burden on him. Archer should have been able to escape by now if he were by himself. But the exit is further now that it came to save me. He must be an easy target for Castor, as she is above us. What may initially come across as the actions of an imbecile boasting, as if he can handle an opponent he can't possibly compare to, it is in fact the conflicted emotional outburst of an individual that feels a potent sense of personal guilt over being saved by someone that put themselves in danger in order to do so. However, to truly understand Shiro, we're going to have to dig deeper into the psychology of his character to gain a stronger understanding of his mindset. First off, it should be noted that Shiro has a pitifully low level of self-worth which ties to his survivor's guilt, as revealed in a flashback later on in the story. For those unaware, survivor's guilt is a mental condition in which the individual feels as if they've done something wrong for surviving a traumatic event when others did not. This is a trauma that Shiro experienced as a child. A trauma that even a fully grown adult would find difficult to cope with becomes astronomically more severe for a young child. As such, his survivor's guilt manifests itself in a way where he shows a clear disregard for his own life, greatly in favor of saving others. Shiro has conditioned himself for several years now into thinking that he should use his life for the sake of others above all else, and that it doesn't matter if he loses his life in the process, because by his measurement, he didn't deserve to survive the initial trauma to begin with. To truly encapsulate this feeling and therefore reveal the core of survivor's guilt and understand why Shiro went down this dark mental road, it is as if to ask the question, why did I survive when everyone else died? 
To further understand Shiro's struggle with his survivor's guilt, it is important to bring up a dating event that occurs later on in the story between Shiro, Rin, and Saber. During this event, Shiro realizes that he was actually enjoying himself, and despite that, this is what entered his mind. It was really fun, the town I only used to walk by. I didn't know all the things I didn't involve myself in were so meaningful. As soon as I think so, something like a cage falls on me, and I understand. I don't deserve this. I'm unworthy of all this. It tells me so from deep down within me. This inner monologue in particular is an extremely pivotal piece of the puzzle in regards to understanding Shiro's survivor's guilt, something that is completely missing in the anime adaptation. In the anime, it is almost exclusively portrayed as a fun dating episode, where the three of them go out into the town and have a good time. One could almost argue that it was even filler content, because it didn't serve much purpose for the plot. However, this monologue very clearly defines the purpose of the event. It wasn't just a silly break for the characters to blow off steam. The narrative significance is to crystallize Shiro's broken psyche for the reader. He can't even enjoy a simple day off going out with friends and not punish himself for it in the process. And honestly, who can blame him? His survivor's guilt is a difficult mental burden for anyone to shoulder, made all the worse by him experiencing the trauma as a young child, which severely affected his mental state for the rest of his life. Now, without revealing the traumatic event itself, it's important to note that this adds another layer to Shiro's actions, as well as informs us to the nature of his inner monologues. Going back to the line, I can't stand to be a burden on him, in this instance specifically, it relates to how he can't accept someone else going out of their way for him, as his self-worth is such that being saved causes him to feel the same sense of guilt that was caused by surviving the initial trauma. Guilt that someone would willingly put themselves in danger for his sake when, by his own measurement, his life is worth less by default. That being said, I want to make this point very clear. Shiro is not suicidal. Shiro is not actively trying to end his own life. He simply doesn't care if his life ends if it's for the sake of others. I want to make that distinction clear to avoid any confusion on the matter. Having established the nature of Shiro's refusal to accept help as being a byproduct of his survivor's guilt, it should also be noted that Shiro has conflicted feelings towards Archer as well, something that was alluded to sometime before the scene at the temple. Shiro has not made it a secret that he doesn't like Archer, and Archer similarly has shown disdain for Shiro, something that becomes incredibly ironic given a certain reveal that comes later in the story. There is a scene early on where Archer looks after Shiro as he walks home, which spurs their first one-on-one -on -one discussion. Let's take a quick look at the scene in question. I feel bad for Tusaka, partnering for such a cynical guy. Man, I'm stunned. Are you still saying such things? I will warn you. Do not worry about your servant's personality. We are only summoned to fight. We are only a tool bound by the command spell. You guys have total control over us, so ignore what your tool has to say. I can't tell him that's not the case. Archer, the one bound by the command spell, said it's definitely true. I can't think of Saber as a tool, but it's true that Saber is bound by the command spell. So why did you stop me? Do not tell me it's something as ridiculous as wanting to make friends with me. Ugh, I don't have a reason. I just didn't like him. So I wanted to complain to him. The purpose of this scene is to do a bit of foreshadowing, but also to demonstrate that there's clear friction between these two characters early on. Shiro conceding to Archer's logic regarding Saber is an especially potent blow, because he knows that Archer is correct in a more objective sense. But emotionally, he can't agree with the notion that he should view Saber purely as a tool. In the face of Archer's cold pragmatism, Shiro can't help but want to rebel even if on some level he knows he's right. 
However, part of the conflict is that Shiro is also correct in his own way. Saber has been treated purely as a tool before during the events of Fate Zero, and that didn't work out so well. Unlike what happened during Fate Zero, Saber actually trusts Shiro as opposed to her prior master, because he doesn't treat her purely as a tool, making his method ostensibly irregular for the Holy Grail War, but effective nonetheless. While Shiro understands that what Archer is saying is correct, that doesn't necessarily mean that what Archer is saying should be completely trusted. Since the anime only adapts the spoken dialogue during this scene, and not the inner monologue of Shiro's conflict regarding what Archer tells him, it becomes more difficult for the audience to understand Shiro's fundamental dislike of Archer, therefore making the previously detailed outburst during the Archer vs. Caster battle seem even more childish. What's interesting and important about this scene, however, is that Shiro rarely speaks poorly of others. Saber, in a scene shortly after the confrontation between Archer and Caster, points this out to Shiro, as he chastises Archer for his pragmatic worldview. It is rare for you to insult someone. I've only been with you for a few days, but I understand that you are not one to insult others. Indeed, it should strike one as odd given Shiro's general behavior towards others. This is a way of cluing the reader in on how Shiro's disposition towards Archer is not only irregular, but more than likely specific to Archer. However, prior to their first discussion, Shiro himself didn't really understand why he doesn't like Archer. Shiro's initial dislike is a guttural, emotional reaction that he can't quite put his finger on. This early back and forth where Shiro starts to get to know Archer helps him begin to understand what it is exactly about Archer that rubs him the wrong way, as illustrated by his internal conflict over seeing Saber as a person rather than a tool. This acts as the first real spark that will eventually evolve into the next scene during the Archer vs. Caster confrontation, particularly just after Archer successfully dispatches Caster as he stops her from continuing her energy beam attack. I see. Then you two are alike. Huh? Alike? Me and Archer? What... what makes her say that? Am I wrong? You both do not like meaningless killings, right? That boy over there cannot stand a servant like me who feeds on innocent people. You don't like meaningless killings. See, it's exactly the same. Is that not why you two are cooperating? You idiot! How can you reach that conclusion? Who would ally with such a guy? I feel the same way. We're both pacifists, but our principles are different. It is my principle to take care of problems early on. I do not ponder forever like this man. What do you mean by pacifist? I still remember you shot at Saber along with Berserker, even though you were hiding in a safe place while Saber was out fighting. Couldn't be helped. We were not cooperating back then. It's just that defeating Berserker came before Saber's safety. <laughs> or what? Don't tell me to save everyone I see. If that is the case, Berserker would have to be saved as well, and I would not be able to fight him. We glare at one another. Man, I just can't get along with him. Why does everything he says get on my nerves? Caster in this scene pretty effectively touches on some nerves by comparing the two of them directly, which only serves to make Archer and Shiro resent each other even more. However, what's truly of note here is how Shiro reacts to Archer's methods. Shiro is the kind of person that goes out of his way to try and save everyone, while Archer is far more pragmatic and is willing to let innocent lives be lost if it contributes to a larger goal. Archer follows the doctrine of the lives of the many outweigh the lives of the few. Shiro, being an idealist, finds Archer's cold pragmatism sickening, despite the fact that, unbeknownst to Shiro, Archer more closely follows in the footsteps of a very important figure in Shiro's life, Kiritsugu, Shiro's adoptive father. It is a very intriguing dosage of thematic irony when you consider that Shiro's idealism also comes from Kiritsugu himself. Shiro wanted to become a hero because Kiritsugu himself wanted to be one but felt that he failed in the process, and that by the time he adopted Shiro that it was too late for him. Hearing this, Shiro decided to become the hero that he felt Kiritsugu wanted to be in his stead, in essence a vicarious embodiment of Kiritsugu's true ideal. Now while Kiritsugu did believe that the lives of the many outweighed the lives of the few, it stems from the more core belief that the ends justifies the means. 
Kiritsugu wanted to achieve world peace and an end to all conflict no matter the cost. There's enough to discuss concerning Kiritsugu's character to dedicate his own video to, so I won't delve much deeper, but for the purposes of this video, it's important to note the influence he had on Shiro. The reason being, when you take Shiro's survivor's guilt and his desire to fulfill his adoptive father's dying wish, suddenly Shiro's character starts to appear much more cracked and twisted. Shiro feels guilty because he thinks he shouldn't have survived the initial trauma, but he survived because his adoptive father saved him. Shiro then began to idolize Kiritsugu as a hero for saving him, and on Kiritsugu's deathbed, he confided in Shiro that he failed to be the hero he wanted to be, which prompted Shiro to take up his mantle. Shiro, as a result, is now a selfless idealist born from guilt and the desire to fulfill his surrogate father's dying wish. It becomes a disturbing Ouroboros in that he idealizes the very thing that makes him feel unworthy of life. Guilt from being a survivor, yet idealization for the one that saved him. It's really no wonder why Shiro is so mentally unstable, even if it doesn't seem like he is at first glance. Getting back to the third part of this equation, we're not done with Archer just yet. While we've gone over why Shiro finds Archer morally repugnant, it might shock you to find out that he's also fascinated by him. This aspect of Shiro's disposition towards Archer is regrettably downplayed and arguably absent in the anime adaptations. So let's go over a few instances where Shiro reveals his subconscious infatuation. During the Archer vs. Caster fight, Shiro makes an almost obsessive note of Archer's swords. Archer is still holding onto those swords. His red clothing. His black and white short swords are both beautiful, and they captivate me. This is indeed strange. Am I captivated by those swords? They must be great swords with history, but yet I feel no malice from them. Unrefined twin swords made without a will, as if to question the meaning of the swordsmith. I think those are swords like that. Mirrored swords without vanity? Black and white, strange swords that represent yin and yang. I am captivated because their existence is just too beautiful. Now it should be noted that a big part of the reason why Shiro went into such slavish detail into how he felt about these swords is because Shiro is infatuated with swords in general, not just archers' swords specifically. However, I bring it up because this is the first time Shiro has done this up to this point, despite also seeing Berserker's sword and not dedicating nearly as much headspace for it by comparison. This inner monologue is supposed to serve two main purposes. Firstly, to emphasize how strongly Shiro does in fact feel about sores, which ties itself back up narratively at a later point. But secondly, and more importantly for what we're discussing, it is also to show his growing admiration for Archer, particularly because this line of thought occurs just before he tells Archer he doesn't want his help. This clearly demonstrates that there's much more to Shiro's behavior in relation to Archer. A little after the fight with Castor, Archer also goes up against another servant known as Assassin. Here, the two of them duke it out in a one-on-one -on -one sword fight, and here's where things get really interesting. They attack each other with amazing techniques. I'm quite fascinated by the scene. To be honest, I can't understand Assassin's technique. Even to my experienced eyes, it's, it's just way too fast and too sharp. But maybe that's why I am fascinated by his technique. The twin dancing swords. Archer is defending Assassin's incomprehensible attacks with a technique I might be able to acquire. To be honest, you could say I admire it. He is fighting off Assassin's demonic technique with techniques only trained by his will and not his natural talent. Damn, it's natural that he's strong. Strength unlike Tosaka or Saber. All the training he went through because he's not extraordinary. He probably had nothing. That's why he took the small thing he had, trained it with all his might, and got it to that level. 
here we see Shiro almost plainly admitting that he admires Archer, but more than simple admiration, he very specifically sees himself in Archer. This is because Shiro understands what it means to not be extraordinary and to work hard with what little he does have. Shiro is barely a mage and is only able to perform a couple of low level spells and yet he's thrust into a battle royale with adversaries he can't possibly compare to. Yet in the midst of this chaos, he sees Archer, a man he can't stand on principle, but begrudgingly respects and admires for his skill. This reverence stems from the understanding of the hard work and determination it took for him to take his lack of talent and to temper it into a highly specialized skill. With all this in mind, I would say it becomes very clear as to why Shiro is so conflicted with Archer. He sees himself in someone that is like a funhouse mirror of his ideals. Similar enough in some respects, but the differences are like a mockery for what he stands for. However, behind those ideals is a man that he can't deny he desperately wants to become. A lot to unpack for what is a simple scene of him yelling at someone to let him go, don't you think? Now, I want to say that the purpose of this video was not to dissuade anyone from watching or enjoying the anime. If you have strong, positive feelings for it, I think that's great. The purpose of this video was simply to explore and explain why fans have such differing perspectives on Shiro Emiya. I hope this video has cleared some misconceptions and hopefully sparked some interest in the Fate Stay Night visual novel. I want to thank all of my friends who lended their voice acting talents for the video. I'm sure most would agree that me trying to quote the lines of the female characters in particular would have been less than desirable. I hope you all enjoyed the video. I look forward to seeing you again next time.